Well, good morning. What a gift we have to be able to come and worship together today. The Lord is so faithful to us, and He has given us an opportunity to share in fellowship that is unique to His people, and so we're grateful for that. We get started this morning, just a couple of things um, you may have seen on your way in. There are stands set up in the front and the rear, uh, a sign-up list for mowing this year, and uh, it's going to be that time before we know it. Uh, there is equipment provided at the church. We're just looking for people who can come and put in some of the time to help take care of the grounds. So if you're able to do that, uh, there's a sheet there you can sign up with, and somebody will be in touch with you on how to uh, be a part of that work. Um, also, there are some forms that are sitting out there, and I have a copy here. Uh, these are, it's called the Charitable Contribution and Membership Information Audit. It sounds very formal that way. Basically, we're looking for information. Uh, we do have to submit uh, every year to you uh, contribution reports and things like that for the purpose of taxes and all of that. And uh, I think what we found as uh, Joe was going through getting some of those ready is we have a lot of addresses that might be two or three houses ago or things like that. So if you have... Uh, a reason to update your information, something has changed in recent days. Uh, if you could fill one of these out, or there's this nice little QR code on here. So we're getting really fancy apparently, and I'm going to assume he's not here at the moment, but I'm going to assume that's going to take you to a form that you can fill out online and just enter your information and it'll save automatically in that database for him. So uh, Joe's just hoping for some help there on that so he can keep everything going. As much information as you're willing to share, we'd be happy to have that, and that helps us uh, reach out to you as we need to also. So Keep those in mind. Also this evening, we will be meeting for uh, the Lord's Supper uh, at 6 o'clock. We'll take the Lord's Supper together, and then we'll share in a fellowship meal to follow, soups and sandwiches. The church is providing uh, cheese and crackers and things like that to have with the soups, but looking forward to being together uh, for that later today. We we'll invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We are just continuing here, and I want to say thank you, by the way, to, to Daryl uh, last week for leading us uh, in, in the Word and for preaching to us. Uh, did a wonderful job, and my hope is just more to see these brothers able to do that. Uh, James, I know, is kind of on standby. If nothing else, uh, we don't know what's going to happen with us in the days ahead. Uh, Maggie has another doctor's appointment tomorrow, and we'll see when they want to take this baby. So um, just kind of... Uh, Waiting on that, but we did enjoy. Thank you for sharing with us, Daryl, and uh, we look forward to more of that. But we are going to pick back up in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, the last two Sundays that we were together in Philippians, we looked at verses 1 through 4, and we were considering there some foundations for Christian unity. You go back into chapter 1, uh, we talked about uh, how we're called in verse 27 to let our manner of life be worthy of of the gospel of Christ. And so we talked a little bit about what that means, and one of the things we see that's important to that is that we as God's people walk together in unity. He says, Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And then Paul carries that theme forward into chapter 2. Uh, you look at verses 1 and 2, he says there, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And then in verses 3 and 4, he helps us understand how we can do that. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. What do we see in those passages? We see that true unity within the church is fundamental to living in a manner that's worthy of the gospel, and the path to unity in the church is marked by humility and self-sacrifice. That's the kind of life that God calls His people to. A very high calling. Not an easy thing for us to do. It goes against our nature. But thankfully, as God calls us to this way of living, we have help along the way. 
God has been faithful to redeem us, to call us to Himself. He has filled every one of us, if we are followers of Jesus, with His Holy Spirit to guide us and strengthen us and to encourage us and to chasten us when we need it. He's given us His Word. And He has given us a prime example. Because God has not only told us how we ought to live, but He has also showed us how we ought to live. And that's where God's Word brings us to this morning. So if you have your Bible, we're in Philippians chapter 2. We'll be reading this morning. We'll read verses 5 through 11. We're not going to finish all of it. But we'll read together verses 5 through 11. Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. We'll stop there. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning for bringing us together here in this congregation to be able to share in sweet fellowship, to discuss your word together, to bear one another's burdens and encourage one another as we walk together in the faith, to be able to point one another toward the truth, to profess our hope in Jesus Christ in song, and God, to hear your word and to be taught by it. And so God, I pray that through the power of your spirit and the truth of your word, you would do just that, that you would teach us, that you would teach all of us. God, that you would help us to live in a way that honors you. That as citizens of heaven, as people who belong to you and who have a King Jesus who we wait for, that we would reflect your kingdom and live in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. And so as we look to your word today, I pray that you would help us to see the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, to learn from Him and God to live accordingly. God, we rejoice this morning that in this community and across the state and our nation and around the world, there are gathered together a great multitude which no one could number. And many continue to be added to that multitude. From every tribe and language and people and nation, there are people who are gathered who have been called by your Spirit under your name, Jesus Christ, through the cross, have been given redemption and forgiveness of sin. And together, we wait for the day when we will be with you. But while we wait, we delight in you. And so I pray you would be with those who are gathered in many places today under the banner of the gospel lifting up the name of Jesus. God, we pray that you would be in our midst, and God, we pray that you would be in their midst as they come to worship you. And God, would you work to transform your people for your glory, for our good, and so that we may faithfully take the gospel to the ends of the earth. God, help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. In the beginning of his gospel, John gives us kind of a unique perspective on the incarnation. That's a fancy word that talks about how Jesus, the Son of God, took on human flesh and came into this world. Um, John writes this in, in his gospel. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
After that, he shares a brief word about John the Baptist who came as a messenger to testify to that light. And then he says this, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then in summary, he tells us the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus the Christ, the eternal Son of God and God himself, creator and sustainer of all things, left the glories of heaven. He condescended, he came down to be with us. The Bible tells us that he willingly laid aside his majesty, leaving the splendor of heaven where he was eternally enthroned in order to be born in human flesh and to bear the sins of his people. Daryl read from you, to you earlier from, Coloss- from Colossians chapter 1. Jesus, the inv- image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. And he talks about all the things that Jesus did. All things were created by him, through him. He's before all things. He holds everything together. And yet he has come to reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the blood of the cross. Eternal God stepping into this world. The author of Hebrews writes that long ago at many times and in many places, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power, making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Go ahead and switch over to this microphone. I'm not sure what's going on with this other thing. You go to Philippians chapter 2. The Lord is, or Paul is, essentially retelling this story to us. He's telling us about how the Lord has come into our world. And he uses the incarnation of Christ to teach us how we ought to live. If anyone ever deserved glory, it was Jesus. Can we agree on that? If anyone ever deserved to be put first, to have all of the preeminence, that was Jesus, right? If there was ever anyone who did not deserve humiliation or pain or suffering or sacrifice, it would have been Jesus. But the Bible tells us that he took all of those things upon himself and he did it with joy. Why? Because in so doing, he would bring about the redemption of sinful people like you and me and bring glory to his Father who is in heaven. Now, as Paul, in this letter to the Philippian churches, is calling the church to unity under the banner of the gospel, he tells us what it's going to take for us to be able to do that. And he shows us here in Philippians chapter 2 how Jesus is our great example who leads the way for us. And we're going to get into some specific things regarding this example that Christ set for us. But before we get there, just take a note of verse 5 there. He says in verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He uses the same word that's used in chapter 1 verse 27 and twice in chapter 2 verse 2. When he talks about having one mind or being of the same mind, we've talked about what that means to be single-minded as God's people, to have a common understanding or wisdom or have common feelings and thoughts about the things of God. And Paul is making that point again here. As we strive to have one mind, that mind should be the mind of Christ. Perhaps your translation refers to having the attitude of, of Christ. New American Standard says it that way. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
The idea here is that people who belong to Jesus, who, who call him their Savior and their Lord, they, they ought to want to be like him. We're told in Scripture that that's, that's God's plan for his children, right? That we would be conformed to the image of his Son. We, we want to be like Jesus. The way that Jesus approached life is the way that we should want to approach life. And that's what Paul calls us to do here. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, in Christ Jesus. Well, we have to ask the question, what would that look like? What would it mean to have the mind of Christ, to have the attitude of Christ, to go about our lives the way that Jesus went about life? Well, Paul, thankfully, shows us what that looked like for Christ here. He shows us what Jesus' example is. And there are a few characteristics we're going to pull out this morning as we look at the Scripture. First thing I want us to see is that the mind of Christ is marked by humility. Really, all of verses 5 through 8 would point us to that. We'll, we'll start, though, reading here, verses 5 and 6. He says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, like I said, we could go on from there. All of this really speaks to this humility that is found in Christ, but we'll stop there. We get a good glimpse of what it means for Jesus to be marked by humility. One of the things that Paul reminds us here is the fact that Jesus, before he took on human flesh, where was Jesus? Who was he? What was he doing? It says here that before he took on flesh, he was in the form of God. Now that word for form, it refers to an outward expression of sorts, of an inward reality. It speaks not nearly so much about appearance as it does about essence. It's about the, the nature of someone. As a matter of fact, the NIV, I think, uses that word. It says he was by very nature God. And then that's the point that's being made here. Jesus was, by nature, God. So what does it mean to be by nature God, to be in the form of God? Well, one thing to understand is that first and foremost, it's not about physical attributes. Okay, We, we, we couldn't sit here and draw a picture of what God looks like. The Bible does sometimes speak in, in anatomical sort of terms, right? You, you read things about the Lord that, that tell us things. So, for example... 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9 says this, that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Well, so we, we, we read that here and we say, okay, so God has eyes. But then we read about those eyes that are running to and fro throughout the earth. That doesn't make much sense when you look at it that way. The point of that verse is not that God has physical eyes like you and me. The point of the verse is that God sees, that he's watching over his people, that he's, he's taking note of what's happening in this world. There are plenty of passages in Scripture that talk about the, the mighty hand of God or his outstretched arm. You know, God parted the seas for Moses by his outstretched arm. Well, did God reach down with some giant arm and just lay a ditch in the sea? That's not what happened, right? The whole point is that God is moving in power. He's, he's able to reach down into this world and to act and to move and to have an effect on things. Statements have nothing to do with actual physical attributes. It's about, it's about us trying to understand how is it that God is watching over us while well, his eyes are going to and fro throughout the earth? How is it that God intervenes in our lives and does things? Well, he's strong and mighty and he, he reaches out his hand and he takes action. Right? That's, that's us trying to figure out how do we describe what God is doing. So this is not really about physical attributes. It's about the essence of God. John chapter 4, Jesus says that God is spirit, right? Those who will worship him will worship him in spirit and truth. So what does it mean to be in the form of God? It speaks of the eternal majesty and glory of God. It speaks of his infinite beauty, his holiness, his power, his might. Everything about God that makes God, God. That is the form of God. That is the nature of God. We've, we've read about some of that with relation to Christ in Colossians and Hebrews and in other places. This is God with all of the beauty and the majesty and the glory that comes with that. Paul describes God in 1 Timothy 6 as the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in inapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. And he tells us that God has honor and eternal dominion. Well, what we read here in Philippians chapter 2 is that Jesus, by his very nature, 
was, is God. He was in the form of God. So everything that was true about the Father is true about the Son, and the New Testament makes that abundantly clear. And so to be in the form of God, we couldn't begin to scratch the surface in 10,000 lifetimes. But this is the general idea of what it means to be in the form of God. Everything that God the Father was, everything you think of this ruler of the world who's enthroned in the heavens, that's true of Jesus the Son. And that's important. Because we need to know that to understand who Jesus was and why Jesus was able to come and to save us. And it's important to this passage because it makes what Jesus did all the more incredible. We're told that though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. That word for grasped, it describes a prize that would be taken hold of, that one might refuse to let go. Something that's snatched up and carried away, and you're just going to take that, and you're going to hold it close, and no one's ever going to take that away from you. That's the idea here. And it says that Jesus didn't consider his majesty, his glory, all the benefits he had from being God to be something that he was going to cling to in that way. Now we know that Jesus didn't have to take hold of anything. He was by nature God. He was God for all of eternity. He had always been God. But he didn't use that as an excuse to keep him from carrying out his Father's will. That's the point that's being made here. Jesus didn't get called upon to carry out God's plan of redemption and say, oh, no, sorry, I'm God. I don't do that kind of stuff, right? You ever ever met that person who thinks they're, they're too above any sort of difficult task? If anybody would have had right to claim to say, I'm not going down there. I'm not getting in the middle of that. Jesus would have been the one. But he didn't, he didn't do that. He held his heavenly position, his divine attributes with a loose hand. And he was willing to let go of much of the majesty and the glory and the wonder that was his for the sake of those that he loved. Now, in no way did he cease to be God, but he certainly laid some of those things aside when he came into this world. John MacArthur explains it this way. He says that during his earthly ministry, Jesus never denied or minimized his deity. He was unambiguous in acknowledging his divine sonship and oneness with the Father, yet he never used his power or authority for personal advantage. That was the choice that set the incarnation into motion. He willingly suffered the worst possible humiliation rather than demand the honor, privilege, and glory that were rightly his. He had all the rights and privileges of God, which he could never lose, yet he refused to selfishly cling to his favored positions as the divine Son of God, nor to view it as a prized possession to be used only for himself. Now you consider that in light of what Paul wrote in verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant to yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. If there was ever anyone who lived out this text, it was Jesus himself. It's what humility looks like. It means not acting out of selfish ambition, not seeking our own glory. It means putting others first. And that's what Jesus did when he chose of his own accord not to count equality with God a thing to be grasped, not something to hold on to, but something he was willing to lay aside for a season for the sake of his people. And we know those people in our lives who will take their position what, what little bit of authority they have, the power that they have. Perhaps it's in the workplace and someone has a particular title or position and they say, look, that work is not for me. I, I do the important stuff up here. Somebody else go get dirty. Somebody else go take on that task. We, we know those kind of people. Conviction has fallen. It's right there. We've been those kind of people. We can struggle. We have this idea that there are things that may be somehow beneath us, and Jesus did not approach his life that way. You want to have the mind of Christ, though. You're going to have to be willing to, to lay aside whatever privilege you think might be yours. We've got to be willing to humble ourselves. It happens within the church. We, we think that because of our 
length of membership or maybe the money that we put into the bank account or, or, or whatever other things we may do. I've, I've done this or I've done that. We think that somehow we, we have this special position and ought to be afforded certain privileges. I'm thankful that's not something that I see happening around here on a regular basis, but I've been there before and you probably have been too. There's no room for that in the kingdom of God. That's the kind of thing that will tear apart a church. So he says, to take on ourselves the mind of Christ, and one of the ways we do that is we humble ourselves, and Jesus presents for us this example. Not lording over, not taking his position as something to use against, but he uses his position to serve. So we begin with that principle that if we want to have the mind of Christ, the first thing we need to do is we need to be humble. The next thing we see, the mind of Christ, we're going to have the mind of Christ that is marked by service. Paul says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So we see here in verse 7, and really we see it throughout this passage, how Jesus was an example of, of service. We're told here of three things that Jesus did to put himself in this situation. We're told that he emptied himself, that he took the form of a servant, and that he was born in the likeness of men. All these things really an extension of his humility, leaving the glories of heaven, not holding on to that, but letting it go. But in this extension of humility, Jesus came to serve. So we see there first that in coming to serve us, that Christ emptied himself. This goes back again to that fact that Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Though he was entitled to every bit of glory and honor that the universe could possibly give, he did not insist on receiving it. Instead, he left the majesties of heaven to come into this world. He laid those things aside. You need to understand he wasn't losing anything related to his divinity. Uh, divinity. Again, we didn't cease somehow to be God when he came into the world. But he was choosing not to exercise his divine right, not to take for himself all those privileges for a season. So how did the Lord empty himself? It explains it for us, that he did it by becoming a servant. The text says that he took on the form of a servant. The word used for form is the same word that's used in verse 6 that refers to one's nature. So Jesus was by nature God. He was the eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. He reigned in majesty. But he became by nature a servant, a doulos, a slave. It's defined as one who is devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interest. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. This is what Jesus did. He emptied himself and became a servant. How did he do this? He did it by being born in the likeness of men. It's an important thing for us to understand there. Jesus did not just appear human, as some have suggested, but he was human. Scripture is very clear that he came into existence as a flesh and blood human being. Understand this, that God the Son has always been, but Jesus the man was born of a woman. He grew, he lived, he died. We know that during his lifetime, he experienced things like hunger and thirst. He got tired. He got overwhelmed. He needed to, to go away to quiet places so that he could pray and go to his Father. We know that he felt human emotions. He was angry. He was sad. He wept at the loss of a friend. We know that he faced temptation. It's one of the ways he can sympathize with us. And so while Jesus was not merely a man, we have to understand that he was certainly, truly, indeed, a man in human flesh. There is a question that arises here. In emptying himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, we've already kind of answered this, did Jesus cease to be in the form of God? And I just want to revisit this because I think it's important. Better put, by, by, by taking on himself the nature of a servant, did the fact that Jesus was by nature God change at all? And of course the answer to that is no. 
Jesus was by nature God in eternity past. Jesus will be by nature God in eternity future. Jesus is by nature God in eternity present. He was by nature God during the time that he was in this world. His essential nature did not change. In fact, it could not change. He only chose to lay aside his rightful claim to glory for a season so that he could carry out God's work of salvation for sinners like you and me. But through it all, he was still by nature God. If you read in the New Testament, you read in the Gospels, and you see there are those moments where Jesus says, look, if I wanted to, we, we, we could really do some things here right now. But he chose not to do that. You know, he could have called those legions of angels, right, to deal with every enemy and conquer this world and say, I'm ruler now, and you're all going to bow. But that's not the way he chose to work. He was going to the cross. He knew where he was going. And he wasn't going to interfere with that. He was going to carry out this plan of salvation. You don't lose anything by becoming a servant. If anything, what he showed us is that being a servant is within the nature of God. We have a God who loves his people, who gives himself up for them. And Jesus shows that as he takes upon himself the nature of a servant. Kent Hughes wrote this. He said, Christ did not exchange the form of God for the form of a slave. Rather, he manifested the form of God in the form of a slave. Jesus said in the Gospels that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And he demonstrated this by emptying himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. To have among ourselves the mind of Christ requires a commitment to service, looking not only to our own interests, but also to the interest of others. This is what we have to do in all of our human relationships. In our marriages, what do, what do we have to do? This is not always about me. There's someone else that I've made a commitment to, I've made a pledge to, and so I can't just live for myself. There are other people involved. If you're a parent, you've got children, right? You can't just go out and live an independent, carefree life and think that you can just do whatever you want. You've got other people who depend on you. And so serving be, being someone who follows the example of Christ here means laying aside our own interest for the sake of others. It happens as we interact in the workplace, as we interact in our communities, and it needs to be happening in the church. You know, it's interesting, our, our, our lesson this morning in, in Sunday school, looking at Acts chapter 15 and seeing, uh, you know, the very first question we had had to do with some of those things that, that cause strife and division among us. What are those things that can divide us? And, and what are the things that we should divide over or the things that we shouldn't? And so often, it's, it, it's not the important stuff that tears us apart. It's matters of opinion and preference and things like that. And what we're being told here is, look, those things don't matter. Forget getting your own way. Look to the interest of others. Jesus emptied himself. He took on the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of men. He provides for us the ultimate example of what it means to serve, and we're called to follow his example. And then in taking upon ourselves the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ is marked by sacrifice. Again, you see all of this through all of these verses, but we see it kind of played out to its fullest in verse 8. Starting there in verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So having been born in the likeness of men, Paul tells us that Jesus was found in human form was unmistakable to those who interacted with him in his life that Jesus was a flesh and blood human being. You know, theologians and people who've tried to ask all these different questions have tried to find ways to explain that away. No way could God really defile himself with human flesh. Well, look, it was very clear to the people who knew him then. It was easily figured out that this, this, is, this is someone who's come to us in the flesh. Those who rejected his teaching, they didn't have any question about this. They believed him to be only a man, but perhaps a madman. They called him a blasphemer. And in their hatred, they sought his death. And they would succeed in putting him to death. When they beat him, he bled. When they nailed him to a cross, he bled and he died. 
But it's important that we remember that it was not ultimately his enemies who put Jesus to death. Because Jesus chose to die. He allowed himself to be crucified as a sacrifice for sinners in order that they, that we, might be saved. Paul says that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You think of that idea of being obedient to the point of death. We certainly don't think that way. We, we do everything with our power to avoid that, right? We, we know we have this enemy that's lurking, that there's, there's a time coming, right? Right? But we do everything we can to fight against that. So we'll, we'll try any treatment. We'll, we'll go through any course of things to try to, try to avoid that or at least to, to push it out further. We fight against death, but it says here that Jesus was obedient to the point of death. The eternal Son of God who had never known anything but abundant, joyous, glory-filled life subjected himself to death willfully. It began by taking on human flesh, which inevitably decays and dies. But it would be worse than that. Jesus subjected himself for our sake to immeasurable suffering. He allowed his enemies to bring about a premature death, the worst possible form of death, crucifixion on a Roman cross. It was the Phoenicians or the, perhaps the Persians who had introduced crucifixion on a cross, but the Romans had perfected it. It was a long and torturous process that had been reserved only for the worst of criminals, which is quite incredible considering Jesus had done no wrong. The authorities who had the power to take his life knew that. I find no fault in him. But he was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And in his death, the Lamb of God would take away the sins of the world just as it had been planned. The one who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus came to sacrifice. And there is incredibly good news in all of this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Jesus knew this was true, and so he gave his life. He shed his blood for all who would receive him to receive, to receive forgiveness of sin. And that had been his plan all along. Go back to John's gospel, John chapter 10. Jesus says this, he says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This is the charge I have received from my Father. So we need to understand that with everything that was going on in Jesus' world, these, these, cry, these crowds that were crying out, crucify, crucify, it wasn't the Jews. And it wasn't the Romans who ultimately put Jesus to death. It was an act of his own love, his own obedience that put him there. So to have among ourselves the mind of Christ requires a commitment to sacrifice. This is not something that comes easy. This is the exact opposite of what we want to do, right? We, we, we want, our, want our lives to be marked by comfort and ease. We, we want things to be done for us, right? We, we want all the good things that we can get and that we can experience. And yet Jesus, who was God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He laid that aside and came into this world knowing full well exactly what was going to happen. And he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Part of Christian maturity is, is coming to the point where we realize we're not always going to get what we want. We're not going to have a life of ease. We're not always going to prosper. Living in obedience to Christ is often going to call us to do things that are completely the opposite of what we might think would be the best thing for us. Why, why do we come here on Sunday mornings? It'd be easier to be home in bed, wouldn't it? 
Some of y'all especially like, amen, right? Why are we here? We, we, we come to bring worship to our God. We, we come to offer our sacrifices and worship to him. Why, why, do, we, why do we give up our money? To, to, to be able to have a place to meet here. To, to be able to, to, to empower other people to go out and tell people, why do, why do we do that? Because God has worked in us. He's changed us. So many of the things that we do, why, why do we deny ourselves so many of the pleasures of this world? I mean, it would seem foolish, wouldn't it? I mean, even the apostles acknowledge, you know, Paul, Paul wrote, look, if, if Christ hasn't been raised, we ought to be pitied. Because we're foolish for doing all the things we do, making the decisions that we make. Why do we do this, though? It's because we know that God is worthy. And so we offer ourselves sacrificially for his sake. But within the context of everything that's going on here, we're, we're called to offer ourselves sacrificially for the sake of others as well. So it goes back there again to, to not acting out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility counting others more significant than ourselves, looking not only to our own interests, but also to the interest of others. Having the mind of Christ requires sacrifice. Now, in all of this, I mean, the, the reality is we, we know that we, we're never going to have to humble ourselves in the way that Christ humbled himself. We're never going to have to serve in the way that Christ came to serve. We're never going to sacrifice in the way that Christ came to sacrifice. We're not capable of that. For one reason, because he's God and we're not. We don't have eternal majesty and glory that we could ever give up. We're quite the opposite of that. We, we don't have what he had to be able to give away. And certainly we're incapable of giving ourselves as atonement for sin. Only God can do that. And that's why Jesus came. But we are called to follow his example. To be the kind of people that he's called us to be. To live our lives not just for ourselves, but for his glory and for the good of his people. And as we strive to be of the same mind, to have the same love, to be in full accord in one mind, we look to Jesus, who has showed us how to die and how to live for the sake of another. There is an interesting thing, and I'll share this before we wrap up, that happens in, in the Greek, kind of in the background here, that you don't see in your English translations. And this is kind of looking forward to what we'll see next week. Talking about the incarnation, God leaving the glories of heaven and coming into this world. We read in verse 6 that Jesus was in the form of God. Uh, the word for form there is the Greek word morphe, and you don't necessarily need to remember that word. But I do want, don't you to see what's happening in the text. He was in the form of God. In verse 7, we read that he took on the form of a servant. And again, that's the Greek word morphe. So Jesus was by nature God, and by nature he became a servant. And those are things that are unchangeable. These immutable characteristics of God. God, or Jesus always was God, always is God, always will be God. And Jesus is by his nature a servant. Unchangeable. But in verse 8, we read that he was found in human form. Now this time things are different. That word that's, that's translated as form, that's not the Greek word morphe. Instead he uses a different Greek word, schema. And unlike morphe, which refers to the nature or the essence of someone, schema does refer to physical attributes. Things that are transitory, that are changing. So think about it this way. When sperm and egg come together, you create a zygote, right? Which grows into an embryo, which becomes a fetus, which when born is described as an infant. And an infant grows into a toddler, and a toddler becomes a child, and a child becomes a teenager, and a teenager becomes an adult. And then you have young adults, and people who are middle-aged, and people who are elderly. So by nature... What is that individual from start to finish? They're a human being, right? This is why we take up the pro-life cause, because we believe that from the moment of conception, this is a, this is a unique human being that's been made in the image of God. And, and that, that human being is just as worthy of, of preservation and protection as an embryo as it is in an adult. But the, the schema of that person by nature, they're human, but, but that schema, that, that 
physical characteristic that's constantly changing, that's something that we, we just accept, right? There are going to be these transformations that take place. Who you are when you're born is not what you look like when you're 80 years old. You know how that goes. Now, why, why think about that? I, I think we pick up on some beautiful things sometimes when we, when, we, when we look behind the scenes a little bit here. So what, 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 is it, what do these verses tell us about Jesus Christ, the Son? We know that by nature he's God. Every glory and majesty and wonderful, beautiful thing that makes God God is true of Jesus. Always has been, always will be. We know that Jesus by nature is a servant. He loves his people. He goes to great lengths to serve them. It starts here in the incarnation where he steps down into this world and he gives himself on our behalf. He goes to death on a cross because he comes to ransom sinful people. And it doesn't stop there. Because then he sends his spirit to serve on his behalf and he goes to heaven. Well, what does he do? He sits at the right hand of God and he intercedes on behalf of his people. And as he rules and reigns in glory, he continues to serve us by crying out to the Father on our behalf. For a season, Jesus took on human flesh. You wouldn't have recognized him. If you had seen him enthroned in glory in heaven, you wouldn't have recognized him in the son of a carpenter who came into this world. But he was still exactly who he had always been. And after his death, and after his resurrection, when he ascended into heaven and went back to glory, now look, we, we have indications in the scripture that Jesus still has a physical body. He still bears the wounds of the cross, but that body has yet been transformed. And in that glorious body, he rules and reigns in all of his godness. So look, while, while he may have changed along the way, in some ways, came down into heaven, took a, came down from heaven onto earth and took on human flesh, and now he's ascended, he's in a glorified body. Some of those things are changing, but he's still who he was. And that's the only reason he was able to do what he did for us. It's the only way that Jesus could say by being God and remaining as God, the resurrection gives testimony to the fact that this is not just a normal man, but this is God who's come to save. And so Jesus rules and reigns in heaven and he receives eternal worship and glory. And that's where we're going next week. Because what does Paul say? He humbles himself. He becomes obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. But what does God do? He exalts him. And he gives him a name that's above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth to the glory of God the Father. Jesus receives worship and glory every single moment just as he has for all eternity. He will receive it for all eternity yet to come. He receives glory from his people now. And the day is coming when every single human being will bow before him and give glory to his name. We read of those scenes in Revelation where worship is given to this lamb who, though slain, lives. And that worship will go on for eternity. I said this a couple weeks ago, and I will say it again. We are all going to bow before him one day. And we will either do that as, as, as people who have grateful hearts because we know what God has done already in forgiving our sins and redeeming Him, or we will worship Him and thank Him for all that He's done, or we will bow before Him in fear and trembling, knowing that eternal God rules and reigns on His throne, and He will judge the living and the dead. When we come before the Lord, let us come before him as people who will rejoice with thanksgiving, knowing that he has given himself for us, not as people, like those in his day who saw him as just another man and turned him away. If you are here and you are not a follower of Christ, let me tell you, one day you will stand before the Lord and you will give an account. For those who are in Christ, praise the Lord, our, 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 our debts have been settled. Our debts have been paid through the blood of Jesus Christ. They are forgiven. But if you leave this life and you go into eternity still bearing the weight of your sin, you will stand before the judge and you will bow before him. But you will experience 
the condemnation for your sin. I would implore you to turn to Christ. Hear the call of the gospel to repent of your sin and to put your trust in him alone and receive the mercy that he gives. If you are not a believer and you want to talk about that, there are people here who will be glad to do that. You can seek me out after this is over. Find one of other elders, one of our deacons, just somebody sitting around you say, look, I don't know Jesus, but I want to know him. And we'll be happy to share with you how you can do that. Maybe you're here and you've been around the church for a while. You're, you're looking for a place to call home. We'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. We're here to help in any way that we can as we strive to honor the Lord together. We see, though, in the Word, all these things that God's calling us to as we've been studying through Philippians, living in a way worthy of the gospel, being united in one, one mind, one heart, with the people of God, striving together for the faith of the gospel. How do we do that? We've got to humble ourselves. We've got to be willing to serve our brothers and sisters. We've got to be willing to sacrifice. And as we see here, Jesus is our example. The beauty in all of that is that one day, perhaps not in this life, but one day all of that leads to glory. And so we look forward to that day. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your son Jesus who came into this world willingly, joyfully, purposefully, who laid aside the glory and the majesty that was always his and always will be his for a season to come into this world, to humble himself, to serve, to sacrifice, giving his life as a ransom for many. But we know that you don't owe us anything. You didn't have to come. But you did. For no other reason than that you loved us and you desired to save us for your glory. God, I pray that you would get glory from us now. That we would bow before Jesus as King and Kings and Lord of Lords now. That we would not wait till we bow before him in another day, unprepared. And so God, would you work in our hearts through the power of your Spirit to awaken in us the hope of the gospel to bring us to faith. God, here in this congregation and across the land, would you, through the preaching of the good news of the gospel, save sinners today? And God, would you help us as your people, as we strive to walk together in unity within the church, to follow the example of Christ. Not doing things out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, counting others is more important than ourselves. Looking not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others, as we see in the example of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Would you transform us, as you promise you will do, conforming us to the image of your Son. Help us to be like him, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. It has been good to be with you. Remember, we're back together this evening. Look forward to a time of fellowship together. See you at 6 o'clock.